Today, in addition to being the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, is the feast of the great saint, Saint Louis of France. He was the king of uh, France, um, and he did many great things for his kingdom, for the people under his care. He ensured that laws were were put into place to, to make sure justice was upheld, including putting into place the presumption of innocence in the court of law. He gave much money to build uh, and gave much money and built many a building for the service of the poor. He brought great treasures in into the the kingdom of France, and most especially the treasures of the church. One time in particular, it was he that received the crown of thorns. And when he had heard that this that this uh, this re- great relic of the passion was coming to, to to France to him, and he was able to procure it, he didn't wait for it to arrive. He went out of the city, actually with a procession of people, and received it five miles outside the city of Paris. And then taking off his shoes, he processed all the way back, carrying the crown of thorns barefoot into the city. He aided the church on behalf of France in all that she needed, even to the point of of leading an army into the Crusades himself, where he fought valiantly leading his men, and even was captured. But during his captivity, he he was a model of patience and virtue, so great that it even impressed the Muslim captives, captors themselves. But above all of the good things that he did for France, and all of the good things that he did for the church in France, and the, and the rights of the people, and all of that, he was known even more so for his own personal piety and virtue. That was what was most impressive about him. And he had learned those things from a very young age. He was brought up by his mother, whose name, who was an extremely pious woman. Her name was Blanche. And uh, her, his father had died when he was uh, a young boy. <clears throat> And so he was brought up by Blanche and was taught by her all the things of the catechism, all the things of the practice of the faith. She was queen. It was very common for them to to hand that type of education off to another person because they had plenty of other things they had to do. But it was so important, the faith to Blanche, that she insisted on nurturing him herself in those matters. And so it was every single day. He'd sit by his mother's feet and he'd listen to her and hear the instructions that she'd give and he would absorb all the things that she that she did and how to pray and how to be pious and how to be virtuous and he would and what the truths of the faith were and why we believed them. And one such day, a great profound lesson was put upon him, one that he would never forget for the, all of the days of his life. He was sitting there and his mother was teaching him about sin. And she spoke to him and she told him, you know how much I love you, don't you? And the little boy listening intently nodded. And and she says, despite how much I love you, I would sooner see you dead at my feet in your innocence than ever to see you commit a mortal sin in your life. That message, it resonated so clearly to him. And he held it so tight. And he realized that that moment just how important serving God and pleasing God in every single action of the day it was for him to do. And so he went forth and he lived his life according to that. That death was preferable to mortal sin. And it wasn't something that he just kept to himself and practiced himself even, but rather he was, whenever he had the opportunity, he tried to make sure that those around him understood the same importance of a life of grace. One day he was riding on a horse and he was with he had several of the, his aides with him, his, his courtiers, as it were. And they, saw, they, came across, <coughs> they came across a leper in the road. And seeing the man in such a pitiable and painful state, because leprosy is a disease that would, that would, uh, that would kind of almost basically 
rock flash. It was something extremely painful. Seeing that this man in such a pitiable state, not only did he give him alms, but he took advantage of the opportunity, he turned to the courtier who was right next to him, and he asked him, he said, Would you rather be struck with leprosy as this man in the road is, or would you rather commit a mortal sin in your life? Well, the courtier looked at the man, and he could not only see the distress he was in, he could smell it, he could hear those moans, every motion that he made was painful. And he said to, well, that disease is so terrible that I would rather commit a hundred mortal sins than be struck by such a debilitating and terrible disease as leprosy. King Louis looked at his courtier and says, truly, you do not understand what it means to be in disgrace with the Almighty. Learn that a mortal sin is more dreaded than all the evils upon the earth. And this, this lesson, this lesson is for us. The mortal sin is the greatest evil on earth. Today, when we look around at society amongst us, what do we hear constantly about people? People are, people are triggered or people are offended. They're offended and triggered by the slightest little things that go against their own sentiments, their own feelings, whatever makes them personally angry. People are outraged by whatever things go against their own livelihood, meaning that it goes against how they are living their lives at that moment in time. People weep over the rainforest being on fire or global warming, or persons dressed in blackface for a play, or any other number of trivial, nonsensical things. This is what offends society. Yet when it comes to the general debauchery that we see constantly around us, what do we hear? Crickets. Yea, we hear worse than crickets, because not only... Is, it, is nothing said about sin in the world anymore. But we ourselves even are drawn towards that. Sometimes perhaps even falling into sin ourselves. And it's not something that we really always think about the way we should perhaps. Because... If we did, then we'd adopt that same attitude that King Louis had towards sin. We'd see it as the greatest evil on earth, and we would avoid it at all costs. Amongst traditional Catholics, there are really two modes in which one is a sinner. The first is that which is a bit rarer, but it certainly still exists. The first is that of one who is attached to to sin. Somebody who knows their main source of sin, but does nothing to remove it from their lives whatsoever. An exam- examples of this would be somebody who lives in concubinage, or those who own really bad movies, but refuse to throw them away and keep them in their library. Those who dress extremely provocatively outside of church, perhaps, but refuse to dispose of those, uh, those garments which are never decent at all. These type of things, they are obstacles towards grace. They stand in the way of any kind of progress being made in the spiritual life because they are things which can be removed with a bit of effort. And the person sees that and refuses to do anything about it. And in those situations, they need to take that step back. They need to look at themselves honestly and say, what do I love? The answer is, I love sin, if that is my state. I love sin more than I love God. I love sin more than I love grace, more than I love the promise of heaven which I know and believe to exist. I throw all that away because I do not want to go against what I have grown grown firmly attached to, and I don't want to remove that from my life. 
But that is the first step of change. What is necessary is to see that and to remove the obstacle straight away. Only then can we move forward in growth and grace. Only then can we move forward in trying to conquer our sinfulness once we move that true obstacle away from ourselves. The second and far more common way in which people sin is by weakness. The sources of that being plentiful. Whether it's a weakness towards the passions or towards human respect, the comforts of life, timidness, pride, despair, and discouragement, or many other means in which one falls into a various type of sin. And these type of trappings and trippings that come to us, these are the temptations that come to us every single day on a regular basis. And sometimes we are successful in fighting against them. Other times we are not. Sometimes we might fall. Sometimes that fall may be small. Sometimes it may be large. Sometimes in certain areas it may be infrequent. Or perhaps it's more frequent. Or even perhaps habitual if we're not careful. And, but the, the, the core point of it is a weakness. Temptation comes and I do not fight against it successfully. But the remedies for this are very much the remedies which King Louis himself took. First, to set aside a consistent and regular prayer schedule for ourselves. Morning prayer, rosary, evening prayer, examination of conscience, act of contrition, and whatever other devotions we truly want to set as our base prayers. We can always add to it if a day is a, is a, is a, is an easier day to pray than a day that is a full and busy day, but to have a core set of prayer and time for prayers and a schedule for ourselves is of the utmost importance for that consistency. St. Louis did this. He was king of France. He, amongst anybody else, was the most busy in the entire country. Yet he had set aside hours during the day that were indispensable to himself, that he would reserve for prayer, and only of the greatest emergency would he adjust the schedule to them. He was going to pray. He was going to pray daily, consistently, and fervently as he could. Then, secondarily, as the remedy, is the closeness to the sacraments, penance, and a good holy communion. This is something that the king did often. He regularly confessed. In fact, it is his confessors that write later on, after he had died, that they collectively were unaware of a single mortal sin that he had committed in his life through all of the times that he had confessed. It is also something that he went daily to Mass. Every day started off at the foot of the altar as the source of strength that he needed to rule his kingdom. Then thirdly was the way of sacrifice. This strengthens the will. The offering up of difficulties that we have, giving of alms, offering of masses. And this the king did greatly as well. We already talked about some of the penances he did. For instance, walking barefoot those five miles back to the city of Paris with the crown of thorns. He regularly offered sacrifices. He was consistent in giving great quantities of his fortune in the way of alms to the poor, to the sick, and to those who are in great need. And he built entire churches for the purpose of serving God. Mortal sin is the greatest evil in the world. That is our lesson for the day. It's the only evil that kills the soul. It's the only evil that robs us of heaven. We have to see it in this light. We have to work to constantly keep it from our soul. To constantly eradicate it from our lives. To never accept something that is going to take us away from God. It's by that, that constant looking at the life of grace as our number one goal in our life, that nothing is higher, that we save our souls. Yes, it's not always easy. Yes, at times 
we are going to perhaps fall, whether it be in the way of venial sin or, God forbid, mortal sin. And, and in those instances, there's the confessional. We will come right back to it and start anew. But it's by constantly striving after that life of grace and that love of God above all else that we save our souls. St. Louis of France wasn't extraordinary in the sense that he was some sort of superhuman. But rather, just like so many of the other saints, he was a normal man who had normal inclinations. But he was one who constantly strove to, for growth in his spiritual life, to work towards perfection, and never ever accepted sin for himself. That was his outlook, and that is how he sanctify himself. And it's the same means for each and every one of us. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.